Hello, and welcome back to the Large Format Photography Podcast, and this is show number 58, and I'm joined today by Eric Matthey and Gordon Zito. Phew, got that right, I think. Nailed it. Good job. And they're both uh, they're both from kind of the San Francisco area, Bay Area. Very good. So um, it, make, it makes life not, not nice and easy. Simon, unfortunately, can't be with us today, so uh, we can we can talk about him. Exactly. So, uh, but f- first of all, before we kick off, let me just do the thing we normally do and thank our last guest, which was Sandy King. So thanks, <sighs> Sandy. Thank you, Sandy. Yeah. That was a great. Actually, I need to I need to email Sandy about stuff. Thank you for the reminder. Well, I listened. Yes, I talked to him for the first hour, then I had to go, but uh, I did listen to the recording. You did a you did a great job. Well done. Thank you. You're and welcome. I've no idea if we've had coffee donations. I've no idea if we've had emails, but we'll deal with those. We'll deal with those another time. One other thing, whilst um, before I forget, the next show, which is going to be towards the end of October, we don't know exactly when it'll be. We haven't got a date yet. We're going to have a LF our second annual LFPP virtual gathering in the forest. <laughs> In the virtual woods, so we're not going to be really in the woods or the forest. We're going to be, we're going to have a Zoom meeting or a meet meeting or some other meeting. I'm just going to call it now. It's going to be a Halloween gathering, and people should wear. Well, it's yeah. You can you can wear a pumpkin on your head if you want to, or um, or a vampire mask. Please. Uh, So this is our our LFPP gathering in the forest for the autumn of 2021, or for those in America, the fall of 2021. And our guest speaker, we're just going to have one guest speaker this time. It's going to be Ethan Moses. And Ethan's been doing some fantastic things. Holy hellballs. With a self-developing um, 20 by 24 Gordon, camera. have you seen this? I don't think so, I have. So he's oh. with the... He's with oh, the no, I have. I have. I have. So the, the 20 by 24 Polaroid thing, you know, is just... Is 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 on a, a limited run, because, if it's not already, because there's only so much of that material left. But what Ethan has created, and I can't, I can't begin to get my head around it, is a, the next best thing: a twenty by twenty-four in, instant print. I'm doing quotes, instant print with a self-developing back. Mm-hmm. So, amongst other awesome things that he's uh, he's doing, yeah. uh, did, did he build the camera? I don't. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yes. Yes. He and, did. I, and just the camera is just incredible. Yeah. He, it's all it's wood, but it's all three um, D CAD plans. It's all laser cut wood. Like he's. His whole goal is like he'll either sell you the kit and you can build it yourself. He'll build it for you, or I think he might. I, I'm not. Don't don't quote me. But he's talking about all sorts of stuff. I for sure am getting one of the four by five instant backs. He actually owes me one. Um, but he's going to have these developing backs. Essentially, Gordon, it's a it's a sheet film back, various sizes that has a light proof uh, chemical intake, mm. and it's for paper, RC paper, or color paper. He's doing color instant wow. portraits right so that once you shoot you just pour the chems in and develop and he's got the reverse process worked out for rc paper and then also he's shooting uh cool. reversal color paper and so he's just doing it on the spot and, you know after a certain point you can just pull the baffle out even though it's not fully developed because it's essentially fixed and you're in the reversal process you're exposing it to light and just does it in front of people that's so, i think i see the picture of that that's pretty cool yeah it's ridiculous uh, he's coming by the way, he's he's planning on coming um, and doing it at the Ebco, new Ebco no location way, really? in Oakland. Yeah, he's going to swing oh, up wow. the coast. Yeah, so sure. this, that- um, look, there are one or two people listening. So you're not having a chat amongst yourselves. Sorry. What's Ebco? What's Ebco? The East Bay Photo Cooperative or okay. committee. I we we've changed. I'm a founding member. We changed the last part a lot, but it's a nonprofit uh, here in the East Bay of the San Francisco Bay Area. So Oakland, Berkeley, whatnot. Um, that's centered around photography and increasing photography amongst the community and and working with disadvantaged groups. And we just procured a permanent space that we're renting in Oakland, Chinatown. That's really nice. We, we already had one gallery show that's up right now. It's open every weekend, staffed by volunteers, and we'll be running workshops and whatnot there. And one of those is going to be when Ethan does his uh, This Coast Swing from L.A. up. Uh, one of those will be Ethan for for a little while. I mean, I'm assuming you'll have to, in my um, house. You'll have to send me the link to that so I can put yeah. it in the show notes. Yeah, for we're, sure. We've not, we've not included it so far. 
Yeah, I don't think we have, unless it's in your bio. I don't. Yeah, maybe I've talked about Ebco a couple of times. We'll I know, but I don't know whether it's in your bio. I'll have to check. All right, you be. got it. So anyway, yeah, that's, there we are. So that's an, uh, So that's that's our that's our next show, um, uh, and then we'll be uh, we'll be getting to show number sixty soon, and that's then we can put our feet up till the rest of, till the end of the year, maybe. No. Now. Anyway, Gordon, it's really lovely to to see you. We we have actually met once, but you won't remember in 2016. <laughs> the ever lovely Heather Polly, who probably doesn't listen to this show, but if you do, Heather, hi. She um, she she looked after us. She was our tour guide, Barbie, uh, for San Francisco for four days, and she took us into Glass Key Photo. And I remember walking in, and there were two guys behind the counter, and. Uh, one of them must have been you, but I can't actually. Just as <laughs> I can't actually remember you, and you can't remember me, so <laughs> it was equally equally as memorable. <laughs> but um, we ha- we had a we had a chat. I think Heather was looking at some cameras, and I bought some Polaroid Polaroid film, pack, uh, not pack film, uh, you know, impossible stuff, whatever it was back then. So lovely to see you again. Uh, so Gordon, tell us. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, folks will perhaps know you a little bit from the, the store, but maybe not. But tell us a little bit about your life story and how you got into photography and sure. bring us kind of up to date. Uh, well, I mean, my love for photography really started in high school, and uh, I really liked photography, but uh, I was a little bit too lazy to be in the dark room back then. No no digital back then, obviously. Um, I took classes uh, in high school. I took classes in college, but it didn't really get very far. Really, my photography really took off when first digital camera uh, came out, and I purchased one soon after. And it's really allowed me to, uh, you know, shoot and, and not be in the dark room. Um, but it's funny now. Now that uh, you know, come today, come full circle, I'm much more of a, a film shooter. I rarely shoot digital anymore. So that's been kind of a progression uh, of my photography. Um, I am part owner of Glass Key Photo in San Francisco. We are a full analog store uh, servicing, um, you know, the analog community in the Bay Area as well as worldwide. Um, we don't do anything digital there. Not that we poo-poo on it. We just don't. That's our specialty. We have cameras. We have supplies. Whatever you need for analog, uh, fun. You've got a basement of magic and weird crap <laughs> which eric loves <laughs> yes just as a side note folks if you ever go to glass key there's all the nice stuff in the first floor and it's a gorgeous like there's a lot of great 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 stuff up there i almost swore i'm not going to make simon go through and beat me too much today but if if you're you possibly nice or if you go when they're having one of their basement sales where like they let you go down into the basement for 10 minutes, right? Is it 10 minutes, 15 minutes? Yeah, something like 10, 15 minutes. 10, 15 minutes and just grab as much shit as you can and just wow. come up and just like give them t- like 15 bucks, whatever. I mean, there's- I, I couldn't have done that because I need to get back on the airplane. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it's just like all oh, sorts of, and some of it is legitimately crap. Let's, yeah, oh yeah. yeah. And some, some of it's just crap, but like, a full dark room's worth of supplies, like every development tank you could ever imagine, every tray, every everything, all sorts of stuff, cameras. I got like three or four of those 3A postcard cameras when I went. The occasional random like Graflex two by three in perfect shape. I'm still, I'm still really, really bent. I uh-huh. didn't get Mary's Graflex. And there's like there's stuff down there. It's like, a, it's a cornucopia. You know, really. Eric, I hate to tell you this. Uh, we actually sold all that to one person. The entire basement. The entire basement. We Shut the- it. Oh. Yes. <laughs> that lucky oh. girl, lucky or unlucky, depending how you look at it, uh, she bought it all. We put it up there. It's going to fill back up. Oh no, that's it. what we're, we we know it's going to fill back up easily. <laughs> so um, we weren't worried about uh, getting rid of it right away. Oh, so. We've a we've a place in the UK called Secondhand Darkroom Supplies, and he he has he carries cameras as well, and um, he's. He has loads of stuff on his website, but I know there's loads of stuff piled up downstairs in a big lockup, you know, and not a garage sort of thing, you know, a big room or something. I, I love the way you guys say stuff. Garage, lockup, please continue. I'm just, it makes me happy every show. <laughs> so um, I was in need. I'm starting RA4 color printing. Oh, nice. I'm not, I'm not, so I've been gathering all 
bits and pieces. And I quite fancied some of those Kodak viewing filters, you know, the ones you flick up in front of your eyes to mm -hmm. uh, look at the color cast on the print. Yeah. And I was looking at them on eBay and they were like people trying to, I don't know if they actually got a hundred odd dollars for them or something, you know, uh, but I didn't want to pay anything like, like that. Um, so I just sent an email and, and he said, Oh, you mean these? And he sent me a link to, and it wasn't on his website, but he must've created this link for 30 pounds, 30 of your English pounds. And I think there was a few, it was a few pounds for postage, but when I got them, they were still sealed up in the, in a, in the wow. plastic, in a plastic thing, you know, where it's hanging on the, on the shelf in the shop. And they were, they were brand new. Wow, and then, and then, and then I was looking for a, a print drum. I've got a big Jobo 2840, the bigger one that takes 12, 16 prints, I think. And I was thinking, actually, I could do with one for just 10, eight, you know, slightly fewer chemicals, because that's probably just the size I'm going to do. And again, I looked on eBay, they seem pretty much non-existent, you know. And again, he, he didn't have one on his website, but he says, oh, do you mean this? And he sent me a photograph <laughs> and uh, he said, it's got a magnet on it and it's got the, the cap on it and it's uh, 79 pounds, which was, you know, pretty, pretty good. I haven't actually pressed the button on it yet, but I'm hoping it's still going to be there when I do. So is that, well, you shouldn't have told everybody that it's there because <laughs> now it's, <laughs> yeah, now it'll be gone. This so are folks, um, can folks do that with you? Do they ring you up and say, we want this, that, or the other, and do you do dark room bits and bobs as well? Um, you know, we don't do a whole lot of darkroom stuff. We have a lot of darkroom stuff down there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, people. Actually, well, you did have before. Oh, we did. Yes, you're right. <laughs> um, no, there's more. There's a lot more still. <laughs> we do have a lot of people that, you know, call up and ask if we have stuff. And, you know, we're always happy to, you know, look for stuff for them. And they're mm. usually presently prized because, you know, again, there's a lot of stuff. So when we find it, they're like, oh, you really actually have one? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Come on in. <laughs> I'm doing it to them all the time, like email or Facebook yes. question. Like, like I just did just now. Do you have any weird, interesting projector lenses? Larry, I think we do. Come on it, in. You know, like. <laughs> well, so there's a segue. You're, I'm guessing it's your most. Let, let's park glass key photos for the moment. Right. Um, we, we'll we'll share links and folks will. But let, we really really want to talk about your work, and the pandemic portraits dude are they they're there i'm guessing the more recent body of work that you've been working on yes i think so tell us a little bit about how that um if we can call it a project or a series i don't get hung up on the terminology but how that came to be um and tell us a little bit about how you made it happen what the equipment you're using what the ideas were you know the interactions you have with the folks that sort of thing uh, well, the pandemic series, um, the portrait series, really started obviously out of the pandemic era. Um, I think previous to the pandemic, I wasn't shooting very much. Maybe, you know, it's not very much at all. But I, I've shot more during the pandemic than probably my last five years combined. Um, so, you know, during the pandemic, I was a bit on the board side and, you know, thinking, what can I do as a photo project? And thinking, oh, I should do something that's relevant to what's going on in the world today. Um, I was previously uh, more of a, um, this is a while ago, but more of a, um, a landscape artist, did a lot of pinhole work, uh, whatnot. But I started shooting people a lot more, a little bit prior to the pandemic. So I really wanted to shoot people. And there's really no thought behind how I approached it. I still wanted to go out there to shoot and kind of document people during the pandemic. Thus, you know, them wearing masks just kind of signify that we're in the pandemic era. Um, I shoot with a large format camera, um, area tar lens. Uh, if for you, those of you who don't know, that's a lens that's made for aerial reconnaissance during, I believe, the World War II days. Um, originally in a big housing, but in uh, today's world, people take that lens and um, take part of the housing and put it into a camera. Um, I have my, uh, uh, excuse me, a speed graphic, uh, which has a, uh, a rear curtain shutter. Yes. Um, which is necessary because that lens is a subarrow lens, no shutter there. So that combination is my, my baby. Um, that's what I shoot with. Um, it's a, a 2.5 F-stop, which roughly equivalent is a 0.75 in 35 terms. 35 millimeter term. So really shallow depth of field, which is what really drew me to that, that lens. Um, you know, it's that 
a beautiful bouquet, the separation between the, sub, the subjects that sharp versus the, the background that's blurred, just really beautiful. But um, I'm really enjoying this, this project. Um, most of the people I shoot are people I know. Um, I just didn't want to approach people. I didn't know, especially early in the pandemic, not knowing what was going on and not sure that people would be very receptive to it. Um, but I, I approach people that I know. Um, I try to incorporate a little bit of personality, their personality into the shots. You know, there's a few times where like, um, let's say uh, um, a friend of mine, Justin, I shot him in the studio because he's a studio manager for uh, Less Space. Oh, okay. Um, you know, things like that. I recently shot a friend um, within like a bunch of flowers uh, surrounding her. And she's like, uh, She's a, a botanist, so you know I try to incorporate a little bit into it um, without trying to stage too much. I think I wanted more mm-hmm. of a natural feel as well. Um, but yeah, that's kind of it in a nutshell. That's so, um, I guess. Sorry, Eric. The one yeah. you just I just flicked onto your Instagram, and folks want to take a look at some of this work. Instagram is probably the best place. Yes, and your uh, uh, bok choy boy. <laughs> that's me. That's me. That name came yeah, about. B-O-K-C-H-O-Y, B-O-Y. So. That name came about because I, I used to uh, work with Chinese produce with my family. That's uh, that, that's where that name came from. Ah. I was curious. <laughs> Got some weird uh, fetish. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're, I'm looking at this picture. Of, is that Jackie? Is that the lady? Or the, yes, the, that's what I'm talking about. That's that, uh, that I shot recently with her in the, in the so I think if you want to get that, if if anyone's unfamiliar with that kind of aero ektar look, and I and I'm guess I I think you can probably get it with other barrelly lenses as well. We can perhaps talk about that in a mer- in a minute. We can set wind Eric up and get him going. But this is um, Jackie. Is I'm, I've taken my glass off because I'm short sighted and I'm peering at my phone. She is bitingly sharp, and she's wearing a you know like all of them are a mask with some drawings on. And she's peering through this gap in the in the bushes, in the trip with the trees or whatever it is, with these uh, little fluffy flowers. Yeah, I don't know, but they appear white on here, and everything's swirling around. You you've got the bokery swirl, but you've also got the the pattern in in the fo- foliage, and it's just wonderful. But you say she um she works with flowers is that, is that the lady who works with flowers? Yes, she's, uh, she's um she deals with plants um i've only recently got to know her so i, I don't know too much about her um but i know she works for i believe um uh, some city in, in the bay area and works with um helping them decide what plants goes where and, and, and advising them on that kind of stuff you um one way i guess if you is this a project that you're going to you are still carrying on with because whatever people think it's not actually over yet <laughs> no not quite over yet um i thought it might have been over sooner than later but delta came around mm. and extended this project a little longer um i definitely yeah. don't want to push this project beyond where i feel like people are not wearing masks anymore i just feel the integrity is going you know not going to be there if i continue past that right so you know as of now I'm, I'm i'm shooting you know less than i have in the past but i'm still shooting um, I think the most recent two I shot were of uh, Jared and Tim. Um, they both work at Academy of Art, and I was lucky to go into their space and shoot them there. So that was just about a week ago. Uh, Eric, you're on my list. So oh, okay. I'll give you a call sometime. Are you um, wearing a mask, Eric? I'm on it. Maybe some buttons in the shot. All right. All right. <laughs> Well, actually, I was curious because those last two, so for folks who go on to, on to Gordon's Instagram or his website, some of the pandemic shots are on there. Mm-hmm. There's, a, there's an interesting progression in, in artistic style, not just for those, but you've also been playing with some really cool stuff with like split images. Like you're putting in, uh, uh-huh. you know, you're putting in essentially a mask and shooting half the four by five image and then shooting the other half of a five by four by five image, which is something you and I have, have talked about doing in the past. Um, where you'll like shoot a person sharp on one half the four by five, re-expose and shoot them out of focus. Or like you did double exposure with um, a couple who are getting married or are married, um, where there is what halves and you flip them around in the image. Um, and you also, in the pandemic portraits specifically, have played a lot with lighting. It looks like you've like your recent ones are movie hot lights. And prior to that, I think it looked like you were using, you know, flash heads and strobes. Um, so I guess my point would be, 
uh, and this is also really the first time I've gotten to look at your work, right? I've known you for years, mm-hmm. but we've never really talked about what you shoot. Um, there seems to be a lot of a sense of play in the work. Like you're like, ah, I'm going to try hot lights today and I'm going to try multiple exposure. Um, so how much as you've shot over the last year and a half of pandemic, the hell, um, has this also been about like just exploring, like how much have you learned and how much have you played around? Um, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's a good point. Um, I think in the beginning, I was just shooting to shoot in the pandemic thing, but, um, as I shot, I felt like, okay, I don't want to have a similar look across all my images. You know, a lot of my early ones were just kind of plain portraits where they're standing right in the middle, um, which is kind of my favorite pose, unfortunately. Um, but it would be a boring series if, if all the images kind of had the same look and same feel. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think as an artist, you always want to grow. So um, as I progress, I kind of thought of different things to play with. Um, the lights were something that um, I played with in a previous series. Uh, I really like that kind of dramatic lighting. Right that comes from it. I use a um, pretty much like a, a super eight hot light that um, it's super hot, super bright. Um, and I decided I don't want to um, filter because I like that dramatic look. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, everyone says, Oh, you should have soft, soft lighting because, you know, helps, you know, flatter the, the, the subject matter. Not me. I, I kind of want that harsh lighting. I like it. Right. It has a, a movie set quality to it. Um, so that's kind of how that came about. Um, no, no strobe lighting for, for this, um, camera. There's, uh, really no easy way of doing it. At least not that I've discovered. Um, there's no syncing with it because of the uh, curtain shutter. Right. So I have, I have thoughts on that, but, um, oh, you do. We'll, we'll talk afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, especially if you're shooting at slower speeds, you just manually yeah. pop that just like 1000 one. No, run, I gotcha. I gotcha. Find a hole, shoot a, a short, uh, a slower film, or put a neutral density, a really big neutral density filter over that pie plate of a lens you're shooting. Um, how do you though? How do you off center a portrait with an arrow ektar though? Because those things are tack sharp in the center and they drop off like a mofo everywhere else. Like if you off focus, they're yeah. just like they're they're bokeh. Their face goes. Like, um, it's not not easy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to say the least, but the focus is so, so shallow that, you know, even if the model moves a little bit, I kind of say, you know, I guess over time, you know, I'm shooting a lot, you get a little bit experience with it, mm-hmm. um, including working with your subject matter and having them not move. So like, you know, I recognize when they move a little bit, and I have them stay still, refocus, um, right. you know, you do everything you can to get sharp because if you're off a little bit, you're going to be off. Yeah. So, you know, that includes, you know, like working with a model, um, you know, using a loop to make sure that you're sharp, um, those kind of things. So, right. As far as the split image, I want to kind of go back to that really quickly. Yeah. So, you know, it's so good. It's so interesting because um, working at a camera store, I come across all kinds of crazy things and that kind of spurs my creativity, right? So, that uh, split image is a, a split back that I found. We got it at one point. And actually, it's another back you put on. So you okay. take off the, uh, um, you know, the, 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 I guess you leave the ground glass, but there's a viewing hood and everything. You put that in that place and okay. it slides back and forth. So you just take one image, put the dark slide back in and slide it over. Oh, the there, was, yeah. there was one of those available for the, uh, okay, uh, here we go, the RZ <laughs> or the RB, wasn't there? Because uh, I've seen Polaroid pack I think film you're right. pictures. I think you're right. I've seen, because... Mm-hmm. I got my RB really up. Well, FP 100C was going away. So I never invested in that Polaroid back, the pack film back, which is a real shame. But um, a friend of mine used to shoot portraits uh, on the street with that back on with two. Mm-hmm. So he got two pictures on the FP 100C and he would do like maybe a full body shot of the person oh. and then go in and do a bit of detail on, on the one next to it, you know, that sort of right. thing. Um, I do that sometimes with my little pen EE camera, you know, half frame, oh, do a little diptych. You can, you can do um, a full body portrait mm-hmm. of someone, then zoom, not zoom in because it's fixed focus on my one little point and shoot thing. You can go in a bit closer. So I guess that's the same, the same sort of thing, but for a universal four by five graph lock back. Yeah, yes, I, didn't know, exactly. I didn't know those exist. Were they for like, what were they for? Were they for like mug shots? 
Probably IDs, yeah, probably. Yeah, you know, like also, yeah, I would have thought so. Yeah, I'm being arrested to a my straight shot. Yeah, here's my right shot. You, so you've got these ones with the like, with, like the one I'm looking at is a is a guy where he's got half, you know, his face is sharp on one side, and then you've defocused him on the other. But there's another one where you talk about two overlapping four four by five negatives, I think, or something. Oh, like yeah, that. it's the double exposure with the couple. Yeah, so I yeah, think, the, well, him and his fiance. What, what what's going on there? You, uh, I kind of been wanting to do more portraits, you know, like more straight portraits, but more my style. You know, less lovey dovey, but like kind of more serious kind of looking portraits. So I, I contacted my cousin, say, hey, you know, she's getting married. I said, hey, you know, I kind of want to shoot you and your fiance. So let's go shoot. So. You know, like anything else, a lot of it's just born, you know, a lot of creativity is just born out of playing around with things and just like half hazard, you know, accidents, right? So I, I tossed the negatives onto my uh, my light box and when I tossed it, they kind of happened to be overlapping. Uh, okay. I'm like, oh, damn, that kind of looks good. <laughs> so um, could you photograph these two individuals looks like maybe out in the desert somewhere or on a on some on the, on the beach. Yeah, our, beach, our local is beach is kind of a desert here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then you've got uh, in the, as a background, which is a, obviously a double exposure. I say obviously, I think it is anyway. Double exposure on the on the male side, you've got his partner, his female partner, and on the female side, you've got him. Yes, uh, sort yes. of def- as a softer image in the background. It's very very clever. Thank you, thank you. So is this an overlap negative and double exposure as well going on there? Um, not well, double exposure as in like. Uh, it's a split image uh, uh, exposure that uh, we were talking about earlier. Right. Okay. That device. Yes. Right. Wow. That's really good. And then you've gone back and started shooting like your, your pandemic. I'm just going to call them. I don't know what you're actually calling the series. I'm just going to call it your pandemic nights. Oh, okay. Shots because uh, like, okay. because the city at the same time, all of a sudden these really stunning evening landscapes because the Bay area, for those of you who haven't been here, uh, who, by the way, should come here because, you know, it's pretty nice. Um, we we have what we jokingly call Carl the Fog. We, we have this marine layer and every night in San Francisco, like the fog, actually sometimes early mid-afternoons, the fog just rolls in and it can be like four o'clock in the afternoon and all of a sudden you can see 10 feet. And it's really, really striking. And in the evenings with all the lights and everything, it is really, really, really cool. Um, but you combine that with the pandemic when there's nobody out mm-hmm. and normally busy streets are just dead empty and eerie. It's like something out of a horror movie, but they're also, they're, they're eerily stunningly beautiful. Um, so in the midst of all this, like your, these landscapes start popping up and they're perfectly exposed, you know, and I'm just like pandemic, <laughs> it's like pandemic nights, which sounds like it should be a, a a 50s rock movie yeah. of some <laughs> pandemic nights but um so tell me a bit about those because they're yeah, they're perfectly cool. they're perfectly exposed uh, and they're really really cool and you are calling it pandemic nights i'm looking at this uh moonlit one i think i know what this is um i think it looks like it's uh the water coming over one of the inlet pipes out on the beach yes um, uh, uh, pacific up here around there I, okay um uh, these these are probably medium format though, unless I'm mistaken. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, can we still talk about them? Or? Yeah, of course. Dude, uh, we talk about everything. I mean, uh, you know, yeah, I didn't know the rules, so it's um, all good. <laughs> um, start with my hustle blood uh, again. Another series that's born out of um, you know the pandemic era. Uh, you know, I, I felt like everyone, including myself, was watching way too much TV. Oh Jesus! In the beginning, right? I mean, I started writing out of shows to watch after a while. Um, so, you know, I thought, hey, you know, I'm tired of sitting in front of the TV. Let's let's go out at night and shoot because that's the perfect time to shoot during a pandemic. There's no one around. And, you know, it's quiet. I don't have to wear my mask. Um, it's, it's a bit of a freedom, an escape from, from the pandemic world. Mm-hmm. So it was just kind of nice to be out there. Um, I used to shoot a lot of uh, uh, night shots with my digital before I started doing film. And most of it used to be night uh, moonlit shots only so beach shots you know with water flowing you know back and forth mm-hmm. whatnot um so film was kind of scary for me when i first started because i never shot film at night as you know either one of you might know it's you know you have to worry about a lot of different things uh, exposure yeah. which your meter doesn't always expose properly because it doesn't go down that low risk possibility failure you know yep. some films after a certain point 
will not give you equal uh, exposure versus time. So that 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 uh, curve tails off. Um, so you know, there's a lot to, to worry about, but you know, got time, got film, why not? Right. Right. Um, my approach to this was um, I tend to like quiet spaces. So most of my shots are kind of like shot in like residential neighborhoods, kind of pinpointing like certain aspects of, of a, a scene that I see. Um, I kind of stayed away from city scenes, though. I might want to explore that next. I'm kind of running out of place to shoot currently. <laughs> well, why um, not go the whole hog and shoot a few gas stations, you know? That, 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 that could be worth, too. Yeah, go old school. <laughs> do, do, some, do some throwbacks to, you know. That's right. <laughs> um, but um, I'm actually shooting with another friend of mine. We go out together now. He's Walter Wong. Um, and he's been my night uh, buddy. Um, you know, we kind of roam around the city, go shooting. Um, but yeah, well, so, I would have thought for, if nothing else, for safety reasons, it's good to have yeah. someone else with you, isn't it? Someone big, yeah. presumably. It, you know, I, I tend to find like, again, more residential areas is a little safer, but you just never know in today's world. Right. Yeah. Um, who, who's roaming out there. I, I'm not the only one that's bored. Let's put it that way. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, but very good point. Um, that was, that was part of our, our, our thought. We could go shoot together just to watch each other's backs. I, I, I'm just while you were talking, uh, I'm just flicking down and down through your Instagram, looking at these images, and and I have to say, I mean, I've seen a lot of night work. Um, Todd Heido kind of came to mind when I saw the Mister Thing. Who's that guy? Is, hey, <laughs> he's another local Bay Area legend. He, um, <laughs> but but these are so diverse. And you mentioned you you're looking for quiet places, and yeah, but the subject matter you've chosen and the way you've compose them and the way you've exposed them they are just beautiful um w- these would work super well in a little book or you know zine or whatever so you should do that you should you should certainly put these together i think there'd be a ready a ready made bunch of takers for this work uh gordon because they are they are spect- oh, well, spectacular well spectacular is not the right word there's a quiet stillness about them mm-hmm. but there's a the ones in the fog you know are just brilliant and the ones down by the beach I just, I, I could just look at them over. In fact, I will. I'll come back to these. These are ones that just need, they need closer inspection. That's why I like to have a book in my hands, really, you know, yeah. a book you, in my hands. To- you could combine the work and just call it pandemic days, pandemic nights, because all of your portraits are in the day, ah, oh, yeah. right? Not- and then just intermix them. It, Eric, you should take, you should be, take a credit for that. Pandemic days, pandemic I, I nights. I credit if I do that. <laughs> And we know somebody who is a world, actually we know two people, Gordon, who are world-class. Um, something I've, I've learned that I'm not very good at is sequencing when it comes to books mm-hmm. and shows. Mm-hmm. And it's really hard. And there's people who specialize in photo sequencing. Yes. And actually we're, we keep trying to get her on the show and she's agreed to come on the show, but she lives a little remotely and she's hard to get a hold of sometimes. But Minnie and Kelly is one of the really best good. photo sequencers around yeah. she's really really good her and um and jastrub right of course and Anne is yeah. world famous yeah. for she's, what she does busy, yeah Anne's <laughs> a little bit busy but she's a hell of a photo sequencer both those two women yes are fantastic editors and photo sequencers and they're both great people by the way oh yeah they're fantastic i, I love them both i don't especially with the pandemic. I don't get to see either of them nearly as much as, as yeah. I would like. I just had Nanny and Ovid a couple of weeks ago. Oh, nice. nice. Over, yeah. We nerded out for the day and whatever. <laughs> um, cyanotypes, instant RC print reversals. Uh, also another tidbit for the listeners, Ninian is also like a guru of alt processes. If there's an alt process, she's either done it or she knows of it or she's taught it and um, is like, exceptional at it in the dark room like she's a gem of a resource um but anyways you could have her sequence the book sounds good i will yeah. i will try to reach out to her yeah oh and also one last bit for the crowd she's also one of the co-founders of analog forever the magazine yeah so ninian's she's busy but she's yeah, awesome she's busy as well <laughs> yeah um i guess so speaking of influences and people and whatnot you know you you who have you drawn from like in terms of uh, influences from like photographers or other artists, right? You're this, like our vision doesn't happen in a vacuum. 
right? We see other people's work. We pull it in. We're like, oh, that's cool. I want to try that. Um, who's influenced you? Gosh, you know, I, I, I've been really bad about like, like, like looking at other people's work. I, I know I should do it more. Um, people that come to mind, um, the, you know, the great uh, Gordon Parks. Oh, yeah. uh, his stuff's just so fantastic. Um, what a great photographer, great, great artist. He's just so diverse. Mm -hmm. Renaissance man. Um, you know, he does, you know, like portraits, social, social, um, you know, um, justice type, you know, photography. Mm -hmm. He's just really diverse. Fashion. Right? He does everything well on top of that, yeah. right? And also so, composes and writes poetry. Yes, like everything. It, it, it's so natural to him too. If you read a story, like how he got started, it's like, that's it. <laughs> you know, pick up yeah. a camera, a broken camera and then shoot with it, you know? Yeah, so, um, pretty amazing, uh, amazing guy. Um, I draw a lot, a lot of inspiration from him. Um, but there's, there's so many other people I draw, you know, inspiration from. And, and unfortunately, I just don't like follow names necessarily. Mm -hmm. I just see a lot of photography. I'm like, wow, that's beautiful. And I, you know, I, I follow the work, but I just don't remember names, unfortunately. You know, well, it's so really bad of me. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you, if you have a little bit of time between now and publish uh, the podcast and maybe just quick whip through and like pull out a couple names, I think yeah. our listeners would be super interested to see who they are. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be super. That'd be really fun. Sure, sure, absolutely. Cool. The 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 day the day part of your um, new book, <laughs> uh, the por the portraits. Yes, I think I think his name's Hank, but I might just be thinking that because he's got a guitar. Um, the guy on the oh. stool with a is it a steel guitar? I've, I've lost the picture now, but I was looking at it a little while ago. What what a, Nick, right now. Nick, Nick Rossi, he's a local uh, Nick. I wanted to call him Hank because he oh. sounds like he's a cowboy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> is he a friend of yours as well? Uh, yes, yes. Um, he um, he's a friend of mine. Uh, I met him through my partner, uh, Matt Osborne, uh, business partner uh -huh. at uh, Glass Key. Um, local guy who uh, is, is a musician, plays all over the city, all over the Bay Area. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I thought, oh, he'd be a great person to shoot and, um, contacted him. We shot outside on the street. Um, he wanted, you know, bring his guitar and goes, perfect. Let's bring guitar, grab, grab a chair. Let's, let's do a photo shoot. Yeah. So the that, fact that he's sitting on a he's, the fact he's sitting on a chair or a stool in a, in, in a suburban street, I think. And those brilliant. shoes. <laughs> he, like he dressed himself. I didn't. I didn't have anything to do with that. So that was perfect. He's a. Uh, he was perfect for that shot. Yeah, those there's wing a, tips. There's mm. a couple of approaches, aren't there, to to this sort of photography? Mm -hmm. There's and maybe different sort of schools of thought. There's and I'm, you, um, Eric, you'll you'll be able to tell me who I'm talking about. The guy who shot all the Midwest wild wild west western portraits against a white background. You know, full Avedon. Richard Avedon, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, someone who's isolating the background completely and just focusing on the person. You know, you're you're drawing what you can about the person purely from the way he's presented in the image, but you're choosing um, to set something of the person within the frame, which is another well accepted Jane Brown for, for portrait photographer with the times used to do that all the time she her approach would be to always she'd always use natural light but she'd try and put the subject somewhere where they're at ease in their environment you know and do slightly wide angle portraits to show something of the person's character what, what are your what are your thoughts on those two maybe there are more approaches to portraiture but those are two that sort of sprung to mind particularly as you were talking as well about having folks sort of in the middle of the picture and I think that's I love just putting them bang in the middle and surrounding them with things, you know, but there's those two approaches. So there's the one just against a blank wall or, or not. And I wondered if you thought about the, the you know, choices. So my thought, like my approach and how, um, how I think I came about doing the way I do it, where I have more of a background is one of the, um, one of my influences um, was a class I took at city college um, from a man named uh, John Harding who's also another local uh, photographer. Uh, it was my editorial class. And I feel like a lot of my, my shots and influences are kind of have a more editorial feel to it, kind of an environmental portrait style. And I think that's kind of uh, what I've got drawn to over the years. 
And um, my approach is kind of include something within the, the environment around them to augment the image. And, you know, using, using the air XR, I feel like if I shot a plain background, it, you kind of lose a, the, um, the effects of that lens. And, you know, yeah. Yeah. my point sure. is really not, not um, even we talk a lot about, about uh, equipment, my, my approach is really not equipment based. The way I believe is, is um, you know, your, your photography should be based on, on what your vision is and everything else is a tool. So, like, I think this is a style, like, the Aero Atar fits my style. So I use it in that sense rather than the other way around, you know. So that's kind of my approach to that. Yeah, I mean, I can I can take my brownie Hawkeye camera with a, with, with a flipped lens and and I know if I stick it, 14 inches from your face i get a biting sharp <laughs> portrait mm-hmm. of your face and all the rest goes like aerorectarish i'll say mm-hmm. that because it costs me 10 go. quid you know? <laughs> uh, or, or if i use my other favorite portrait my other for- favorite portrait camera is my holger dude those uh, holgers make uh, great uh, portraits yeah. and that that's my favorite type of holger photography is is approaching strangers in the in the in the in the city near where i live in cambridge and saying to them, do you mind? You know, look, I've got this toy camera. Is it okay? And once they once they get past the fact that you're harm, you know, they you're harmless, you know, mainly. <laughs> Maybe. You know, you're no, or you're no threat to them, and you're not going to take their image and you know uh, share the heck out of it, you know, for for money or whatever. <laughs> Most folks are happy, as I'm sure they would be with your Aero Ecto if you want to pursue it. But that Holger, you know, it, it it produces that biting sharp image in the end. Once you've all the Holgers are a bit different, and you'll work out where your sweet spot is. But once you nail that down, you know, you can use it. And and yeah, you it's handheld plastic piece of rubbish, but it produces some brilliantly interesting portraits. Really. Yeah. Well, that actually brings me to a question I've been waiting to ask: Is you know, you've been shooting the people you know. And unfortunately for you, unfortunately for all of us who know you, like we're lucky to know you, you know a lot of really interesting people. Um, but have you ever considered, because for me, shooting portraits uh-huh. is a difficult thing. Like talking to people is shock, shockingly really difficult. You know, one-on-one, it's really intimate. And so it is much easier for people you know. Um, but pushing yourself to take photos of of strangers you barely know, like which I've also done on my trips. You just, you, um, yeah, you've done it seems it, like yeah. the next, yeah, but it's not easy. But it's I was, have like, you ever considered like you see somebody super interesting doing something really interesting? You're like, they would make an incredible portrait. Are you, do you think you'll ever expand to just like approach, like approaching folks going about their daily lives and be like, Hey, mom and kids playing on the playground. Although that's a bad example because people are like, what are you doing? <laughs> kids? But you know, but I mean, just, like going about their take a bag of sweets with you, you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, totally. You know, like expanding it into into that because I have this feeling the pandemic era may become the pandemic era. Like this, this shit's sorry, sorry, Simon. This yeah. shit's not going away no. anytime soon. Soon, you know what uh, I mean? Yeah, you know, honestly, that, that has crossed my mind. I would love to shoot more people that. I don't know. I think it's a challenge, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, like, as you alluded to, it's not easy if you are not comfortable doing it um, or not used to doing it. Um, I, I did shoot a couple, like if you go way back, I shot uh, um, some firemen um, early on because I saw them. I drove around, oh, I got a picture of them. Um, and uh, it's something I want to do. I might continue doing a portrait series, maybe mm-hmm. the pandemic. Um, and maybe include more people I don't know. Um, I, I think I mentioned to you earlier it was it's it was difficult during the pandemic to approach people because we're in a pandemic, right? Yeah. Um, but definitely, um, maybe as the tales, uh, the pandemic tales, uh, you know, away, um, I might include more people I don't know, or like I said, continue a series of just portraits in general with people I don't know as well included. The other uh, the other way to do it is once you've made contact with somebody you know for example and you've made a nice portrait of them particularly if they then got a copy of it yes. is say to them well can you can you point me in the direction of someone else who um and then you've got an introduction haven't you say okay you know bill bill smith said 
suggested you might be willing to pose for me. Here's one I did of Bill. And there, so there you've got, a, you've been introduced to a stranger, but the, the barrier's kind of been knocked down because, yeah. you know, uh, Bill Smith has introduced you to him. Yeah, very good point. The one degree of separation yeah. punched through. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you'll get you'll get after six, you'll end up back where you started. Exactly. Full circle. Somebody's gonna recommend Bill. <laughs> and you'll be like, oh Bill. <laughs> um so for, for, so, and because you've got this interesting, you know, you've got a, a speed graphic, which for a lot of people that oh, it's a real old fashioned camera. And can you and you best. can still get film for that, can you? And you've got this stonking lens on the front of it. You know, I mean, that's um, that's a talking point in itself, Gordon. I really, you know, for anyone out there who wants to approach people of interest, um, there are some really useful things. Have an old camera, you know, because it's a talking point. Yeah. Very much so. be, be interested in them. It's not about you. It's about them. And then once you've engaged for a while, then they'll soften up and you'll be able to. How do they react, Gordon, when they look through the back of it? Like you guys <laughs> set up and they're like, I want to see through the back. It's like, most people are pretty shocked, you know, like, because you, you, as you guys know, looking through a ground glass is just beautiful, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Big like that. Um, but yeah, they're, they're usually pretty shocked. And then they go, like, wait, it's upside down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. I don't want to be upside down. I, the photo is going to be upside down. <laughs> upside down? Well, kind of, but it yeah. doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Totally. Yeah. And- Oh, God, I had another question. But we can do, I know Simon is, I mean, sorry, Simon's not, I mean, Simon might be, but he's not here. But Andrew is also chomping at the bit to talk about, um, you alluded to, like, alternatives to the, yeah. to, I love that term, by the way, stonking. Okay. Like, you know, do you not use that one? No, that one? no, 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 but I'm going to. 100% now, I'm going to break that out in a work call. That's a stonking good blah. Anyways, <laughs> um, different alternatives to the mighty legendary era of Dar, because those aren't that easy to come by and they're often snapped up or they're expensive because by now all of us large format photographers, we know what an arrow actar is and like everyone wants a freaking arrow actar yeah. for good reason. Um, but they're not the only thing that can give you a, a, a tack sharp image in the middle and really interesting, like defocused movement what people call bokeh or boca, tomato, tomato. Um, so I have opinions on alternatives, but um, Gordon, if somebody came meandering through looking for suggestions and didn't have like $500 to spend on narrow actar or something, like what direction would you point them to interesting lenses that could do this type of portrait work? Uh, you know, it's funny um, because I have the actar, I really don't look at other lenses. <laughs> I hear about other people talking about it, so I, I, I have some opinion. <laughs> um, there's a lot of fast, uh, unknown fast lenses out there that people kind of like gravitate toward. Um, mm-hmm. um, I have a Tessar. That's like a 2.8 Tessar, I think. Okay. Um, and I haven't played around with a lot with that, but that kind of gives a really nice uh, bokeh look too. Um, I hear a lot of people talking about like, you know, like projector lenses, the bull, right? Mm-hmm focal lengths but a lot of people play with that and that kind of gives a, a, a really nice swirly look to it right uh, each one has their own kind of uh characteristics i've seen images from all these different ones and they all look beautiful just a little bit different so you know it, it's they're out there you just have to decide you know what is more affordable and what kind of look you want uh, right. Eric, what, what are your thoughts what uh what ones are you thinking of um well i make my own usually which is this whole like different rabbit hole to go down um which is yeah perhaps yeah if you're a glutton for punishment you can make your own camera lenses um but lately uh and it's actually shockingly simple actually full disclosure it's not that freaking hard um but the last couple weeks i've been playing circle back around to uh projector lenses um i've managed to procure Actually, I've got another one coming, but like, I think I have with this new one, I've got four projector lenses and I started with the same one. Andrew talked about the, the lights, medium format projector lens, which is also in its own way, like slightly legendary. Um, yes. Another one we'll talk about. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I've shot it on my speed graphic, my three and a quarter, four and a quarter. And it mostly covers that, that image size. But what I didn't realize at the time 
that I got that lens is, you know, most projector lenses come in a massively long barrel, yes. right? Because they're made to project images out and the barrel is as close as possible to the point of origin of the image to capture the light as well as it can and funnel it down, which on the reverse side is not that great for, for photography because it limits the light, the cone of light and the size of the image that it can make. Um, but if you cut that, if you either take those lenses, the glass out of there and put them in the same order and sizing in a different shorter barrel, or you just do what I did this week and take a hacksaw on a Dremel and yeah. cut that thing off at the, at the back. Right. So it's within like for the Europeans, uh, like 15 or 15 millimeters or 20 millimeters to the back glass or for us Americans, like, you know, half an inch, quarter inch, that back glass, it covers a much bigger area than it was ever intended to as a projector lens. So like the two medium format projector lenses I just converted this week cover four by five. I haven't checked to see how much movement, like if you throw the front around, how much move, how much movement it'll handle. But if you shoot it straight with a little bit of shift, it covers four by five. No problem. Um, and those are F4 and F3.5 respectively. Um, and they're pretty cheap. I think they they were both one I got from the surplus shed, Fred surplus shed, surplus shed.com. My, my, my drug dealer, pretty much. Um, he gets projector lenses in all the time. And I think it was like 15 bucks. That's so cheap for the four and a half inch or the four inch one. Mine was, 20, I, mine was 25. I was looking yeah. at, um, I'm invariably looking on eBay, not that I've got any money to spend, but <laughs> I was just curious. And there's one on here at the moment, a light, light, is that right? Vetslar, yep. like a color plan 90 F 2.5 projector. That's lens a really it, good one. In a sort of stainless mm-hmm. steel, or, you know, aluminum barrel or something. And um, 90, pa- 90 pounds plus five quid for postage. Yeah, that one in particular, that 92.5, I was doing some research this week looking for shorter, wider ones because specifically for my for my Pentacon 6 medium format, mm. um, that one's really popular. Like that, people really rate that lens very highly. And most of them actually use it for macro photography. Mm. Um, most projector lenses are bought by macro enthusiasts. Um, but right. man, if you take that, but I ordered uh, another... Uh, Icon, Zeiss Icon. So, you know, West East Germany, I think it was back in the day. Um, 90 millimeter Q5 that should be arriving this upcoming week uh, for the Pentacon. But yeah, that's that's a good find, actually. Um, those go for a little bit more than the ones we were talking about just because they're very popular. And anything with Zeiss or lights on it, like, boing, it just goes up by like 35%, 50%. Cost. And- question for you guys I don't me. so okay you know people adapt uh you know large format lenses including the area of tar to medium format and sometimes <laughs> even 35 which is i find ridiculous but you know i understand the focal length stays the same when you talk about f-stops how does that work is it is it equivalent stay the same is a 2.5 and a large when you put it onto a medium format what is what happens to that and how does the the um I guess that the, the field work with that. Any, any thoughts? I just shoot it at what it says it is. And that usually seems to work out like F4. I shoot it at F4 and I mean, I test it before I do anything that's meaningful. Um, and it seems to be generally okay. Um, Cause the aperture is just, it's the same measurement no matter what. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to affect, it's probably going to affect depth of field. I would have thought. The depth of field is much different though. Yeah. yeah. Like the, the F4 on that, on my Pentagon versus on um, my Intrepid 4x5 is much different. Um, so, I'm actually finding that the, the depth of field on that F4 and that F35, I tested them yesterday in the city. It's still too, like I want, like you, Gordon, I want like razor thin. I'm looking for, I'm looking for the drop off. Right. And if I shoot anything further away than, 10 maybe 15 feet i get too much at the field like like if you shoot a projector lens and you want the drop in the bokeh you have to stay relatively close because after after a certain length physics takes over the depth of field increases further away and you lose all of it so you're not going to shoot like a, a, like the the transamerica building and get like all like woo, like yeah that's not gonna that, happen that's um 
technically known as projection ratio. So the further you are away, the projection ratio is uh, which way around is it? Whichever way around it is, it means that the effective depth of field becomes greater. Mm-hmm. And as you come one to one, so as that projection ratio gets bigger, I think that's the term one to one, then depth of field gets infant gets lots, lots, lots smaller. So yeah. projection projection ratio and um aperture size are the two things that would affect uh depth, depth of field. Jason Lane, as he's listening to this, is typing a reply. Yeah, you're talking bollocks, Bartram. God, <laughs> do I have to correct you guys every time? <laughs> Yeah, Jason, well, there's no, there's no one here. I can just say these things confidently, and you, yeah. no one knows. But projection, yeah, exactly. yeah. projection ratio. That I believe is, you. I read it in a book somewhere. Hundred percent. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, projector lenses work really well, um, and also you, can, like I said, you can roll your own for sure. Lenses, not other things, but if you do that, dude, that's cool with me. Um, and then, I think. <sighs> Sometimes you can find, well, they're too small for four by five. So I'll just, I'll, I'll not go there. I was going to say like, there's some really interesting like cinematography lenses out there, but that's mostly for medium format, you know, stuff that they shot like 70 millimeter film with back in the day can make really interesting um, medium format lenses and can be sometimes had fairly cheap because everyone's getting rid of their old like Bolexes and and everything else. And um, it's just that the register on those is usually pretty short. Right. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing I'm finding with projector lenses is the rear register, the, the back focal length is generally 15 to 20% shorter than its effective focal length. So if you're buying like 105 millimeter, its back focal length is usually closer to like 90 or 85. It's much shorter than its front focal length. Um, so if you're shooting like a medium format camera, like the Pentacon, which has a 69 millimeter flange distance like you can't buy a 75 millimeter projection lens and have it work out not gonna work Mm. like the 90 millimeter i'm super worried isn't gonna work but i wanted a wider lens than the the four and a half inch that i had so i went for it hopefully it'll work out okay enough gear rambling yep nerds nerds I'll, I'll jump back to your website and I was looking at your website earlier and I know you said it's not up to date but there's some beautiful work on here Gordon. There is. Um, again using the Aero Ektar um, but this just goes to show what can do it because Eric was talking about portraits bang in the middle of the image and then all the swirly nonsense going around the side but your little series of Ophelia oh yeah is just beautiful the one uh, 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 I need to dwell on these a bit longer to you know, th- these these images are really kind of speaking to me um the one with the when she's standing on a chair and just her white dress and her feet and the wood the wood of the chair you know and the one where she's going into uh some kind of underground uh bunker or something you know it's all there's a certain amount of creepiness about it i guess mm-hmm. um there's a certain amount of melancholy um clearly a single girl alone in the frame it's a sort of vulnerability as well there but you know the, the compositions you've used is really interesting, and there's even a portrait where you've just obscured her face. Well, actually, a, now, now I come to mention it, her face is is obscured in, in some almost way in almost all of them. There's one where she where where it isn't, but then she's set right back in the image in that sort of a whole, uh, dip in the ground, which looks like a cross. Uh, but mostly, she's either got a back to the camera or her face is obscured by leaves, or it's a side profile with a hair. Um, so tell us about Ophelia and how this project evolved, yeah. if we can call it a project yeah. series. Um, Me testing out the aerial car, that's when I first got it. Uh, my roommate at the time, Natasha, uh, was really model, so I said, let's go shoot. And we went to the park, which is like a minute away from my house. Um, and, you know, I was just really testing it, and I just fell in love with this lens, so we kept shooting, and um, it became a series uh, with her. Um, most of my images um, kind of have a more ethereal kind of, like as you said, creepy kind of feel to it. Um, it just I like, thought creepy was just a bad word, but it was just, you know. <laughs> uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm going with it. Just you about it. Right. Hit it. <laughs> but that's just the kind of imagery I like. Just something more, I don't want to say dark, but, you know, I guess a little more on the darker side. I kind of like that uh, look. Um, um so I kind of went with it. Um, I felt like not showing her face too much 
kind of lent to that um, kind of a animosity, uh, not animosity, uh, anonymity. And, and that's the word, yes. Yeah. Um, and um, it, it, from there, that's kind of where I started like, a whole series of like just different models. Uh, you know, I shot them in the park. I shot them in hotels. There's a series where I did with uh, this other model where we just went to all these different hotels and we just kind of walked in, found um, you know, public areas where people weren't congregating and just set up and shot. Most of the times we didn't get caught. A couple of times that we got caught, we got kicked out. <laughs> what camp we were using the Arrow Ectar for those uh, shots as well? Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's fast, right? Put them near yeah, a window. I suppose so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You could <laughs> hit it. Uh, it was, I really enjoyed that. It was just a little, a little bit of, um, you know, uh, Excitement to that uh, shooting it. A little bit of pirate. A little bit of fr- yeah, yeah. F- furtively meeting in a hotel, but not not in the way that some people might think. <laughs> so yeah, you know, most of you know, shot, uh, shot in black and white. Um, I tend to like black and white for several reasons. It's kind of lends that that kind of feel of uh, that I like the kind of that the eeriness, um, but also I like to process my own, and I don't do a lot of uh, color processing. Mm. Um, and I just feel like sometimes people put color into images when it's really not necessary. Um, well, that's another that's another whole debate, isn't it? Which, oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> what? Um, Although the the color slide versions of some of your pandemic knives are very very nice. Thank you. I, I can take take um, slides with it, you know, with my other shots because you know who doesn't like color? But I am holding side to side, and I always end up liking the black and white more in, in in general. In general, yeah. I mean, they're very nicely muted. This well, yeah, I was I was always and initially before before the days of the internet, really, and before I was exposed to m- many more people's influences than I was back in the day before the World Wide Web. Uh, I, people people's work I'd see in magazines and things. The, the color images I used to enjoy most were those monochromatic color images, you know, mm-hmm. and and that's probably because I'd always just seen and photographed in in black and white. So the one, the color images I was drawn to were those sort of fairly monochromatic ones. Yeah. And Gordon, it, you talk, sorry, go on. I was going to ask, uh, carry on, sorry. I was just going to say, speaking of color and black and white, just comparing the, the sidecar motorcycle photos of Brian color and black and white are really interesting because like in black and white, it looks like a black motorcycle and in color. It's actually like a bluish gray. And it seems to me looking at the background, the I, I always say polka, which I know is a reader's vocabulary, and it's probably wrong. Um, and the color actually feels like the, the black of the term, the bubbles, they actually seem more apparent in the color than they do in the black and white from the arrow actar. It's really interesting comparing the two side by side. Um, yeah, I, ha- I think, um, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, color, I think, um, adds a different feel to it. Um, you know, you got separation. Uh, based on color, whereas with black and white, you're you're separated by tone. Right. So, um, you know, I think um, I think there's obviously different feels and different looks. You know, you look at something that's you know, red on black in color, it's gonna pop. Right. But black and white, it's gonna fade into each other because you know tonality they're very gonna be very similar. Mm-hmm. Unless you stick a red filter on, of course. Oh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um. But yeah, I mean, I, I do like, uh, I, I do appreciate color photography. I think for me and, and the type of shooting I do, I tend to like the uh, the black and white stuff a little bit more, um, just for my stuff. But I, I, you know, not to say I don't like other people's work in color, but you know, Gordon, on your website introduction, uh, and it must be true because you wrote it. You said, um, um, "Hello, I'm Gordon, and I live in San Francisco." Well, we've established that. I, I like to see myself as a storyteller and photography happens to be the way that I tell stories. Well, uh, tell us a little bit about that. Perhaps to expand a little bit about photographic storytelling. Sure. Um, you know, I think it's, it's almost uh, something I try to achieve whether I do it or not. Um, I would love to, to pe- you know, for people to see my images and just see it beyond a pretty image. I want hmm. to, I want readers to look at it and kind of interpret it and kind of envision a story from it. And that's kind of how I, I approach my photography. Um, I think, you know, as, as you go along as a photographer, you're always evolving, right? In the beginning, we all shoot, you know, the bridge. We all shoot, you know, pretty shots. Um, mm-hmm. I think I come to the point where, like, 
I'm not really looking for a pretty shot necessarily. It's nice to add prettiness to your shot, but I want to see an image that you can kind of look at and just kind of dive into, spend a good five minutes, 10 minutes just looking at, exploring all the different parts of it and kind of interpreting your own story from it, you know, without me having to say anything about it. And that's how I kind of, I don't know if I achieve that, but that's kind of what I, I strive for at least. That, that certainly helps visual storytelling with people in it. I think I'm just trying to think, is it easier to try and infer a story? Cause I think going back to your pictures of, uh, of entitled Ophelia, any one of these I could look at in isolation and build a story around it. And now my story is going to be different to Eric's and yours probably, but my imagination would take me in all sorts of different directions with any one of these. Now, again, if you sequence them in a certain way, Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess, do you, do you single images or or series of images? Which Um, works best for storytelling? Because I've got my thoughts on it, which I've probably just alluded to. (laughs) I personally think that um, it kind of depends on on, on your goal. Um, yeah. I think in a series, obviously, you kind of want to talk with a, you know, I mean, that's that's the name, you know, a series. So you want to talk in a story within a, uh, several images. As far as my approach, I tend to be more individual on most of my projects. Not everything, but um, you know, like I have a Chinatown series, which I feel you know, it's, it's better as a group rather than an individual. It tells more of a story that way. I think the Ophelia one, because of the nature and how it started, it was more of individual, sh- you know, uh, shot story rather than a series that tells a, a combined story. Um, and I, I appreciate it both ways. It just kind of depends on, on what you want to say. Um, but I think mine tends to be more individual, I think, rather than as a group trying to tell a story. Yeah, I was looking at your Chinatown images and, and they're um, a mixture of people, mainly people again, some sort of candidate type pictures, some clearly not candid, some buildings. And so they, I would think that in the same way that, um, you know, the uh, the book Americans, who who produced Americans? I've forgotten the book. Amer- Americans? Americans? Yeah. You know, Wasn't that? Famous, uh, famous photographer. Um, uh, why am I spacing on that? Anyway, it's famed for its sequencing, isn't it? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a go-to book for reading it like a cinema. Yeah, that was cinematic. Robert Frank. Robert Doug. Frank. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, why am I spacing so on you, that? I know. Me too. So you read it, oh. and as you turn the pages, it's almost like you're. Oh man! And and if you turn turn them quickly as well, it's almost like you're in a movie. You know, it's take. There are linked themes from image to image, mm-hmm. and then it changes and shifts, and then there are recurring themes. And I think a sub, you know, subject matter like Chinatown would lend itself, and what I see of your images would lend itself to that. So we're back to sequencing again, aren't we? And bookmaking and all that sort of stuff, yeah. Right? And storytelling. So this was the the Chinatown ones. Was that? I'm guessing these weren't large format, but I'm, I'm not sure. Are these with your Hasselblad, um, my uh, my Rolleiflex. Well, yeah, even better. It's all the good stuff. Gordon's rolling the names of all the good stuff. Arrow Ektar, Speed Graphic, Hossie, Rolly, like mm. all too easy when you want to carry store. <laughs> yes, this is true. Like this is just gonna go out of stock for a little while. I'll just need to test this for a bit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I to make sure it works. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. I'd be the worst at your job, your day job, man. I would be oh. the worst. I will say that after a while, like my lust for cameras has died down. There's very few that I'm like, oh my god, I must have. Right. Mm. I think it's a, it's a. They're objects of beauty, aren't they? You know, us for, really for analog photographers. Yeah. They're, they're, it's very difficult not to be drawn by somebody sharing a photograph of, of a particular camera. Saying, no, that would be wonderful. That these days I stop and check myself because I think, well. You know, my focus is the dark room, and, I, and my focus is the final image. And I've got enough cameras to make images with, mm-hmm. and, and I've got enough pinholes to make images with. I don't, you know, like, n- like there's the, need, need and want, isn't there? Mm-hmm. Like the Pen FT half frame, the Olympus Pen FT with the beautiful F. Yeah, that's like, one I've just, always kind of lusted after, but I won't buy one. 
you know you should buy one they no, are no. they are the single for me the single best handling yeah. slr i've ever used like it just when you shoot with it they handle so well they're a little dim because of half frame okay. it's not always easy to shoot with but they just they handle so good I know, and they're yeah. so beautiful. Yeah, so no, like, I know. There's loads. There's loads oh. of cameras that are beautiful, but you're not tempting me. No, but that's the most beautiful. I'm sorry, the Pen FT is isn't. I know it's I was like to- the opposite was- of of large format. It's a half frame, but God, it's an object of art. I was talking to someone who was here just this week, and we we were we were lurching back, lurching back, looking back at uh, one of my favorite printers and uh, UK photographers. Uh, um, oh, for goodness sake, uh, the guy who does the tulips, John Blakemore. And um, I've mentioned him several times on this show before, but, you know, he used for most of his analog career, uh, Gordon, uh, John Blakemore, uh, who came to fame really with beautiful images of tulips in different states of decay. But he but he did lots of other things as well, but that was what he became known for. He just used his... Um, mpp camera which is a you know a bit like a speed graphic it's got i, I think mark seven yeah. or mark eight has probably got the curtain at the back don't quote me on that and he used one lens which was a, a standard lens you know 150 lens and one film stock fp4 one developer type id11 and he just made some stunning images and i was saying to the guy who was i said look you know I kind of want to just get part of me wants to just offload everything and just keep one camera and one lens, but I know I'll regret it, you know, you know, um, having so much access to cameras, I actually have my, a lot of cameras on my own, you know, some of the most sought after ones, some oddball ones, but there's only a small handful that I really use, you know, my, my Hasi, my Roly, my speed graphic or the area Actar. And uh, my pinhole, um, which is a, a, a zero image, 69 medium format, which is one of my favorite cameras. Um, I always say I'm going to rotate and go through all of them. But, it, yeah. you know, but well, you, you may, I think a good excuse to keep them all is that you can reserve them for specific projects or, or images, you know, and you can say, yeah. right, well, the, the, the pinhole is going to be for this, and I'm going to go out yeah. and work on that. And then uh, the rolly is going to be. Because probably the way you interact with the camera will re- end up coming through in the sort of images you produce because some will be more suited for certain types of images than others, probably. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that's what I tell myself. That's a reason for having. I, I will say camera. I do like go for, or I'll, I'll either build a lens or I'll buy or keep cameras. Like they're very project specific. Like this yeah. project is going to use this Nikon with this 105 dental lens because it'll do macro and killer portraits, you know, and that's what that, that's that right there, you know, and like these things I'm going to do the next couple of weeks, it screams the Pentacon six. If my Pentacons are behaving properly, that's a whole different ball game, you know? So it's, for me, it's very specific combination of lens and camera and film for a project. And that's what that's for. But then with just one camera and one lens and one film, aren't you being made aren't you going to force yourself to work harder to create a body of work or images yeah especially if you want to do it differently i mean there's there's Mm. there's a lot to be said for and we talked about this before you know for for getting a look and a feel and you stick with it and that's what people come to you for and you make a a living you know avidon perfect example um yeah yeah sure you know there's there's photographers who just that's their bread and butter that's they bread a and thing butter. and that is what they do and that is what they're damn good at and then they become famous for it yep and but we don't have to rely on that for our living so we can 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 mess around a lot we can. more we can. you know like gordon was saying he doesn't want his images to be the same all the way through the series like no. most professional photographers who are doing this for a book or for pay or for a grant will be like no man the whole thing has to have the same sort of looking feel all the way through for that consistency because that's how I get paid. Yeah. Okay. Good point. You know? um, gents, rather like the last show we did with, uh, <laughs> with uh, Sandy King, I'm, I'm, I'm going to turn into a pumpkin very shortly. So I, I have mm-hmm. to leave. But what I want, what I want you to ask Gordon Simon is to talk about Simon? this other suit. Who are you, Eric? This other series, this other series, because I want to come back and listen to this. The, the other series on your website, the girl in the mask. So there's, so some obvious themes there again about masks and identity, 
and all sorts of things come to mind when I look at these series of images. And some of these are more creepy than the Ophelia ones, um, but I uh, but I love them. So I'm going to leave you, love you, and leave you both. Uh, Gordon, <laughs> thank you so very much. I'll leave you in the capable hands. We we lost Simon. Now you're losing me. And eventually, eventually, Eric will just go, and they'll just be you. Excellent. <laughs> Andrew, thank you so much. And you, can, you can close the show. So it's lovely to see you again, um, even if we don't, even if we don't quite remember each other from five years ago. Thank you, thank you very much, Eric. I'll leave it with you. Okay. And I'm going to press leave. Thanks, Gordon. Lovely. Thank you. All right. See you, buddy. So Eric, I, I, I um, thought about a few uh, photographers that uh, have been ah. to me, so I kind of want to come back and uh, circle around to that. Yeah, please. You that I keep come to mind, um, Susan Bernstein. Oh yeah, with her, um, I really like her work. Kind of speaks to the dreaminess um, that um, mm -hmm. I try to achieve. Another person along the same vein is uh, Keith Carter, um, and his work is really, really beautiful. Um, a little lesser known is a guy named uh, Alexei uh, Turin Turenko. I can't know if I'm saying that correctly. Tita Renko. Tita Renko. Yeah. And his work is really, really haunting and beautiful. I guess haunting is a better word than creepy, huh? Yeah. Yeah. yeah but that's all cool. that. <laughs> but um, his work is really beautiful. And and I'm not even sure what kind of camera he uses, but it's just beautiful. This is one of those classic images. It's an image of a walk, a stairway mm -hmm. with um, some hand railings. And everyone, that, it's a it's crowded time, and you can see. Right. There's other people walking by, but all you see is a blur and a few uh, kind of ghostly images of hands on the rail. Yeah, and feet and legs. Yeah, so this is something, you know, another photographer that, uh, that has influenced me greatly. So, yeah, Susan Bernstein makes her own cameras and sometimes her own lenses as well. Yes. Um, so, like, I didn't know she existed when I was starting to do handmade lenses and that sort of stuff. And I think it was, it was actually Ninian Kelly who was like, oh, you should look at her work, I helped show her around San Francisco when she was up last year, and she's really oh, wow. cool. Um, but she's also a perfect example of someone um, who has a very distinct thing, uh -huh. and she and she's made her bones with it. And yep. this is an insult. This is great. Like she with really experimental photography, and that's what she does. She teaches workshops. She teaches all sorts of stuff. But that is her thing. She shoots images like that. Yep. And that's what she shoots, and she's very good at it. Very good at it. Yeah. Um, but she doesn't really vary much from it, at least not in the work she publishes. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's obviously no insult that that's, it's freaking great that someone can make a living doing what is in the end, very experimental looking film um, landscape work. Right. Yeah. Um, but I, we can't leave Andrew's question unasked. Like he dropped it on us. Then he ran away chortling. Um, the, the girl in the mask series yes. uh, opens really nicely and it's interesting um with is this the same model as ophelia no it's a different model okay um they're just similar enough i'm like is that the same person um but anyway so the really uh interesting beautiful photo where the focus is off and back right it's not on on the the subject at all um it's on actually the face in on the lamp um but it's a really beautiful moody sort of series that ends with after all these photos of only one of them without a mask, at least mm -hmm. where you, it's either partial or out of focus or whatnot with the model, just walking away down California street, her back to you with the mask in her hand. Um, it feels like there was a direction to this. Like there's a, something you had in your head and this isn't just a random series of images. Um, so, so this is actually one of the series that I actually do try to like sequence and, and, and tell a story with. Um, it's funny. This is actually the series that really got me started shooting people more than uh, landscape. Mm -hmm. And um, the backdrop to this whole story is that I'm part of a group called 81 Bs, a photo collective um, that was really born out of uh, uh, City College. Uh, and we had a project that we wanted to do where we, one of the members got a hold of a hotel. I'm blanking on the name of the hotel now. Mm -hmm. But we rented the hotel for the weekend and each person got one hour 
to shoot in the hotel, which I think is a great, great project. Um, I shoot, you know, mostly in landscapes. I'm like, what the heck am I going to do? And mostly landscape with pinhole at that mm-hmm. point. So I thought, well, shooting, you know, a hotel room with a, a pinhole is going to be pretty boring, very static. So I thought, you know, um, get a friend, let's go shoot. So we had this idea of going shooting and I had some masks I got at a garage sale. And I said, let's bring a mask. Let's play with a mask. And um, I started shooting and I had this idea of like, you know, in your head, you start telling your simple story, right? Like right. This girl, that's a mysterious girl. That's kind of like hiding her face, you know, whatnot. And then it's just a story that kept going for me. And I kind of mm-hmm. went with that vision. And after that shoot at the hotel, I shot a few more times with her because um, we had some outdoor shots with her. And, it, you know, it's a short series, not a very long series, but uh, we did uh, maybe two or three shoots and I kind of continued the story from there. And, uh, you know, I don't want to say too much about the story because I kind of want you guys to infer about it yourself, but that's kind of right. how I got involved with all these. So in, in a shoot like this where you have a story in your head, do you interact? Does a model help? Tell a story. Does a model give you suggestions and like, oh, well, what if I pose here? What, if, what about this or that? Or are you, are you purely directive? Surprisingly, most of my models don't. Um, I I welcome suggestions, mm-hmm. uh, but usually I feel like when I have a, an idea, I kind of roll with it. You know, mm-hmm. so, but I, I'm also open to suggestions. I've had a few models give me suggestions that worked out really well. Uh, I don't remember in this case if, if she did or not. Um, and by the way, this is shot with a pinhole. That's that's all pinhole. Okay, I was going to ask because it's not it's not tack sharp there's some places where it seems super sharp but it's not super tack sharp consistently yeah so it's okay. also like my zero image which again like one of my favorite cameras right cool yeah. <laughs> so what what actually took you from um being i guess somewhat exclusively a, a pinhole photographer to actually like using using glass yeah. <laughs> um i think you know like again i have a vision of the style i like the vision I like and, you know, the pinhole worked really well for that, but, you know, you kind of, as a photographer, you kind of crave to grow and try to experiment with different things. Mm-hmm. Um, when I saw Eric Tar and what it could do, I'm like, Whoa, that that's my lens. And, um, you know, I went out and, and saw it. It wasn't easy at that time. There were too many people adopting. I think maybe that's like what, seven years ago or something like that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it was known among a certain crowd, but not among, the wide range of crowd that's not known by now. So, you know, mounting it and, and everything was a mystery because you can't just stick it on, on a, on a camera. You have to find someone that makes a mount for you. Uh, and at the time, uh, I think it was that Jolo was one of the only ones doing it. And he stopped making it. So um, I had to seek out other people to, to convert that for me. Um, but, you know, back to, back to your question. Um, Again, I think I feel like everything's a tool for me. You know, if I find something that fits what I'm trying to do, I roll with it. You know, if it works, it works. But I don't limit myself to, you know, a pinhole because, oh, I'm known as a pinhole artist. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd rather be known for my my work and my style of work. And, you know, all the tools are just tools for me. And actually, I saw previous to starting uh, Glaskey, you ran a studio, uh, not a studio, you ran a gallery. I did. Uh, yes. Most that. people probably won't know. <laughs> it was a short lived gallery. Uh, uh, gallery is a, it was a very tough business to do. But, uh, I ran for two years with another partner, um, Hung Chan. And all three of us went to city college and kind of knew each other through, through city college or San Francisco. Okay. Um, and we decided, Hey, you know, you know, we were all into photography. We thought, Hey, let's, let's give it a try. So me and Hung ran that Matt had his version of glass key within that um like gallery in the back mm-hmm. so um it was called four by five gallery uh we specialized in uh local emerging artists um it was really fun we we had a great time we met a lot of great artists um as i mentioned it was really tough so after two years we said you know let's reevaluate and decided it wasn't worth it going forward at that point so right. but a great experience learned you know learned a lot about you know like critiquing and understanding people's work and whatnot. And again, meeting a lot of great people too. So glass key actually came out of the back of the four by five gallery no, space. Actually, not really. Matt actually started glass key by himself. And okay. his side was known for, 
his film and supplies. Okay. He sold next door and Ricky Ricardo's a record, uh, a used record. Okay. Okay. He started on his own. And then the three of us got together and did the, uh, the new space, which, you know, was um, uh, a split glass key uh, four by five gallery. Okay. And then when, uh, when the gallery ended, I joined Matt and uh, my side is more of the, uh, the gear side. So I'm part of the gear. Cool. All right. Yeah. Cause I remember the original glass key on hate street. Yes. Right. Yeah. It was a, it was a nice place, but we ran out of room. That place was so packed. It was tiny. It was yeah. itty bitty, itty bitty, itty bitty. Yeah. Um, okay. I was curious about that. So, all right. Neat. Now I know, now we know where the hell glass key came from. Awesome. Yep. Uh, did the working or seeing all that different work through the gallery, did that also like sort of influence you a little bit? And it's like, oh, like, cause you got to see a lot, a lot, a lot of work, at least even like subconsciously. Um, you know, I think any kind of work you see influences you no matter what, right? Either positively or negatively. And you mm-hmm. can say, oh, that's the kind of work I don't want to do, or that's the kind of work I want to do. You know, so I'm saying that, not to be a cop out or anything, but yeah, right. it influenced me um, to a certain degree. I need to see a lot of work that kind of fit along the lines of what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you see things you're like, oh, I like that angle. I like that pose, you know, things like that. Or the idea of, of doing this. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. So, um, yes, it did influence me um, to a certain degree. Um, you know, I saw, was, you know, running a gallery like that, you see so much work and so much variety of work as well. Right. Really, really cool. See kind of what people are doing in the Bay Area. Yeah. And the galleries in the Bay Area, sadly, have all sort of, most of them have so slowly faded yeah. away or, or moved. There's new ones popping up here and there, but um, a lot of the old school ones have really faded away. Yeah, yeah, it was it was tough before the pandemic. Yeah. I think most of them actually closed before the pandemic, but I don't know if many are like. Yeah, I don't know how many have survived. Um, but I think, I guess one one final ish question. Um, I'm trying to think of the best way to to phrase it. I think um, you know the 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 pandemic has been. Um, from multiple levels, like from a societal level, from a health level, but also from like um, an emotional level, like a, a massive uh, depressing, depressing downer for a lot of people, right? Yeah. Um, it's been really, really difficult. And people are in tons of funks because you're socially distanced and you're not going to work and you're just stuck in the house and everything. And maybe I'm projecting because that's me. Um, and it becomes difficult to rouse yourself to just go f- do something right um where you have done just that what advice would you give um photographers or actually anyone who Mm -hmm. feels like you're just stuck in this rut and you got to get out of it and you just got to go just get the energy go do something like how would you advise people to essentially you know Get the energy to like get up and go do what you're doing, or even if it's not photo- like not exactly what you're doing, but to go do something, right? Yeah, I think I mean you know that's, that's a tough part, right? Once you get in a rut, it's it's so hard to get out of. Um, you know, as far as photography wise, like you know, I, I wish you just you know think of something that you want to do, you know, a project, whether you know it's meaningful or not. Just go out and shoot. I think it's hard to shoot or go out and do things when you don't have something in mind, a project, whether it's photography or woodworking or pottery, Mm -hmm. you know, I think you have to focus on something, whether that sticks with you or not. I think you just go with it and explore it. Um, If you don't explore, you don't know if you're going to like it. You don't know if it's going to stick with you. Um, For me, you know, shooting, I think I started with a pandemic series of myself, like documenting myself uh, with pinhole and with, no, actually all pinhole. You know, that didn't work out. I didn't didn't really care for it. Um, But, you know, I just, something to do, something to get you going. Sometimes you're going to get a success rate. Sometimes you don't. Mm-hmm. And that's okay though, right? You know, right. it's part of, the, part of that whole process. So I guess my point is don't be afraid to go out and explore something, you know, regardless if you think it's going to work or not. If you feel like that's something that interests you, go do it. You know, shooting portraits, you know, I didn't know it's going to stick with me, but I thought, okay, I'm going to shoot a few portraits, see where that goes. And, and I'm really enjoying it, you know, whether regardless of, you know, successful or not, I just enjoy going out to see people, you know, being social, especially in the beginning. 
you know, and just shooting people, you know, even for that brief 15 minutes to talk to them, you know, it was, was really nice. Right. You know, got me out of my funk, you know, like again, shooting pandemic series at night, you know, didn't want to stay home, watch TV. Cause I kind of, you know, it gets depressing. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's yeah. good, great. Oh, all, all these shows I get to watch. I don't know. We have time to watch. Mm-hmm. After all, you're like, God, I'm just sitting here doing nothing. Yep. Every night. Every night. Every night, eight, like yeah. seven p.m. Yeah. after dinner on. Oh, like, oh, yeah, I'm gonna get out, and, and you know that's kind of how that came about. Just you know having you know just the want to do something. You know, take that step, and you know it might not work, but who cares? You're, you're taking that step. You take the next step if this one doesn't work, right? Right. Exactly. Uh, so I think that's I think that's a good place to kind of that's a good piece of advice to sort of wind it all down with. Um, but what we I don't usually do this part of the show. So sorry, Simon, in advance. Um, what we will, we do typically ask, like, is there anybody you would like to give a shout out to or a thanks to you? Anybody who's been like super helpful or um, anybody basically you want to give props to well, right now? Many people. <laughs> I know, right? It's a big question. Uh, you know, I mean, if I mean, obvious one would be Matt, uh, you know, we're business partners, but we also bounce ideas off each other in terms of, you know, like I have a project, I'm like, hey, Matt, what do you think? This, you know, you think it's a flyer? Or I'll show them images, what do you think? You know, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I have I, a group I mentioned, 81Bs. Yeah. Um, they're a great sounding board. I also have another critique group, a more serious critique group that I'm a part of. Uh, we call ourselves uh, F63. Uh, I have a bunch of friends in there, a, a little bit off from of F64. Yep. Um, but, you know, that, that's a much more uh, serious critique group that uh, has been really great for me. Um, not only in helping me kind of like mold my own work, but also seeing some other great photographers and, and what their work looks like. Um, you know, there's tons of friends that, you know, that, that, you know, too many to name at this point, just because I don't want to single out anybody and miss anybody, but, you know, being in this world, you know, as you know, there's so many great people like, you know, you know, Vince and Anita yeah. Epco center, um, there's a lot of good people out there. I mean, there's a great community in this Bay Area and a lot of people willing to help each other. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And if people want to find your work and see it, mm-hmm. where do they go? Absolutely. Um, you know, I have two main places that I uh, have work uh, up for people to view. Uh, the most current and uh, up-to-date one is going to be Instagram. Uh, Bok Choy Boy, as, as mentioned earlier. Love be- it. K C H O Y B O Y, and my own uh, personal webpage, which I haven't updated lately, but probably should soon. Um, that's going to be uh, my name, Gordon Zito, T uh, R D O N S Z E T O Photography dot com. Excellent. Let me know what you think. Cool. Excellent. And you know, Simon and Andrew are at their usual places, but they're not here to say it. So. <laughs> The regular listeners already know where that is. I sadly and awkwardly can't rattle off their their social media stuff. I'd actually, no. Andrew is War Boy Snapper because weirdly enough, where he lives in England, it's War Boy, which is just bizarre. And Simon is Simon Foster Photography. And then I can typically be found just like you, just on Instagram because who updates a website, which is Eric H. Mathy, E-R-I-K-H-M-A-T-H-Y is my Instagram handle. Um, and if people want to email us, it is large format photography podcast at gmail.com. It feels weird to say that because usually we're harassing the living hell out of whoever has to say it to get them to screw it up. And Andrew and Simon aren't here to give me crap right now. It's really, really weird. I'm lonely. So thank you, Gordon, for sticking through to the end with me. <laughs> and that was really enjoyable. I look forward to actually, and also I'm, I'm intrigued and excited to be one of your subjects. So I'll give you a holler. All right, come on over. And thank, thank you, everybody, for listening. I hope you're having a great day. Bye. Bye.